Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for tuning in to a brand new season of Art Rocks. Here's a clever solution to a challenge many folks are facing here in the era of COVID-19. How to mask up in a manner that's protective, comfortable and creative too. Baton Rouge Gallery was quick to call on artist members to create unique face masks that are both effective in function and creative in form. Here's Gallery Director Jason Andreessen to introduce how those efforts took shape. We've got 65 different masks with 65 different artists, one piece for each artist who's a part of the gallery. We've gotten the feedback that it's made it difficult for some people to decide and, and choose one. Obviously I would say you don't have to choose, you can get them all, but it certainly made things tough for people to choose, uh, but that's not necessarily a bad problem. They range from pieces that feature stained glass. Ceramics. Painting, photography, and everything in between. When we first approached the artists about using their works on a mask, we didn't think that all 65 artists would be a part of the project, that some might have some reservations, and we were thrilled to hear the excitement that the artists themselves had. They were to a T, every single one of them was excited about the project. We received an email that showed images of the different masks and I was immediately excited when I got the email, not only because it would represent my own work, but because I know all the artists in the gallery and I was excited to see their masks and immediately I wanted them. <laughs> the general feeling was, wow, what a great idea and everyone was really excited to be included. This specific project was a way for us to both support the gallery as a nonprofit, but also to support the artists whose exhibition opportunities, whose incomes uh, might have been impacted by this COVID situation. So there was some give and take, some uh, communication between us and the artists in terms of figuring out which piece would be not only the best translation to the shape and size of the mask, but also what would be the best representation of their work. We work with a manufacturer based in London we send them the images and then they print them onto the masks. Once they are produced, then they'll ship them back to the gallery and then we send them out uh, to the people who have made donations to the gallery. The ones that we were a little worried about was how the photography would translate to the mask. The image quality has been great so far, so we've been really happy to see that. Literally the day that we announced to the public that these masks were available, my email inbox was literally just donation, 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 which any Nonprofit leader will tell you it's a good day, it's a good thing to see. Right now we're doing the, these masks as a, a show of gratitude, a, a thank you to people who have been able to go to the gallery's website. There's also an opportunity for people to make a donation and have a mask gifted to a first responder. Now these aren't medical grade masks, these aren't intended for medical settings, but it's a, a nice thank you to frontline first responders to uh, have a, a nice mask that they can use in a more casual setting and show some support for local art as well. As long as you get the right size, they're incredibly comfortable. They have elastic all the way around them, so they create a bit of a contoured fit to your face, which hopefully provides for a lot more safety, more so for those around you than, than yourself, perhaps. Uh, we've heard of people who are going to make them part of COVID archives with, with that our public access. We've heard of people who say that they can't afford a piece of a certain artist's work, but they can afford this, and it's some ability for them to support the artists. Uh, we've heard from people who are going to make shadow box frames of these masks and have them be kind of mementos from this odd time that we find ourselves in. I think the function of it is really sort of the beauty right now, is that it's a functional object that also is very artistic and aesthetic. So it's meeting multiple needs.
Mia Kaplan's inspiration comes courtesy of the wildlands of southeastern Louisiana, specifically the woods and the waterways of St. Tammany's Big Branch Marsh. Using a process that she describes as foraging for images, Kaplan filters the flora that she discovers through a process of abstraction, creating two and three dimensional images that vibrate with the energy of life. Take a look. I go into the environment where I grew up and I draw from life. I spend time observing. I personally found that I was really drawn to floral forms environmental relationships between trees, lights, canopies, positive, negative space. I break my time down seasonally, so it's very much like a plant. I spend a large amount of time outside, just gathering drawings, documenting things. There are so many weeds here, like dandelions, for instance. They grow all over the place here. Dandelions have wonderful medicinal qualities. Same with like the primroses, like you can make a tea in order to induce labor. Hibiscus is used for different things. I'm fascinated by how nature is so important to the balance. We learn so much about life by studying nature. Depending on whether the intended output is paintings or sculpture, I go between the two mediums and I find that the order of them tends to be drawing, paintings, sculpture, drawing, paintings, sculpture. When I first started working in paper, I defaulted to the form of paper folding that I know most, which is origami. My brother used to do origami all the time. So some of my early works are origami-based forms, like camellias, cranes. But I found that when I was sharing them, a lot of people, all they can see is origami. They're not seeing what I was trying to express, which was this idea of transformation. I'm really interested in life cycles and transformation, which nature is the perfect place to study. I started opening up to the idea of working in different materials. Aluminum is very lightweight. It's not the easiest thing to fold and form, certainly not as easy as paper, but I don't care. I do it anyway, like I just muscle it out. Sometimes I have to like, I fold it and then I'll like stand on top of a pile of it. You know, I just make sure that it happens. The way that I compose these pieces is um, I start as a painter. I'll start with uh, very simple, clear sheets of aluminum, primed, all stapled on the wall. And then I will paint all of the sheets of aluminum at once, which is why they look like they're part of the same family at different times of year. It's because they're created in a body of work all at once. After the aluminum has dried, then I just get my scissors out and I just start cutting forms and reconstructing them, which is where it's like in your mind, you're starting over. Whenever you see a, a piece of aluminum that's ready to be folded, you have to be open to the idea of it becoming whatever it wants to become because when you start folding it, the material speaks back to you. I don't want to go this way. Or maybe like I should go here. And so when I'm folding these, I put them to the side. I fold another one, I put it to the side. And then I start finding ones that just seem to go together, pieces that seem to relate to one another in an interesting way. And so I'll start uh, pairing them back together, reconstructing them. When I was asked to create a steel sculpture for the Poydras Corridor Sculpture Exhibition in New Orleans, my friend at the time had said, you know, do you think you can work in large scale sculpture? And I said, yeah. When I went to go look at the materials, the steel kind of reminded me of sheets of paper, which is completely my comfort zone. <laughs> so I translated my work from one medium into another because of the sensory qualities of the material. So steel became paper. So my work, even if it's in steel, it has this lightness to it. There are three works that are paintings presented as tapestries and they feature trees. The trees at that point for me became almost like stand-ins for people in the theater. They came at a time where I was having a, a hard time getting along with someone really close to me and we went out into the swamp and I just saw these trees leaning on one another for support. On the left side of the uh, photo, you'll see these two cypress trees uh, leaning on one another and there's a setting sun behind them and they're, they're 
there's supporting one another, there's humanity in there. People tend to gravitate towards the use of color in my work, and I think it's because we love color, and we associate that with color. So my colors tend to be very joyful and uplifting. The background of these paintings, like for instance, you can see this and like the little bean shapes and things that, you know, they have their forms. There's a framework in this painting which is drawn from uh, one of my illustrations of spiderwort, which grows here wild. It's a, it's a native plant. When I'm speaking to people about my work, a lot of people will say, you know, I don't understand abstraction. And that, to me, it made me really sad because there is a logic to it. Drawing from something which was identifiable allowed me to create conditions that could be understood and I think it makes it more digestible. It's like going into the cellular structure of like what makes something magical and, and special. And in this particular case, there's all this energy and movement and density and like you can see like hints of other flowers peeking through and, and that's it. That's just, that's what the painting is. My favorite collectors are the ones that really, they feel that joy, they feel that uplift. I do have some work in the Mary Bird Perkins Our Lady of the Lake Cancer Center in part of their healing arts program. And Linda Lee, the administrator of the hospital, came up to me and she said so many people were coming up to the receptionist and saying, I'm seeing all sorts of stuff in that. I'm seeing wild turkey and clouds and uh, birds and mountains. And she held me and she said, do you realize that just for like a couple minutes, these people who in many cases are fighting for their lives are just imagining what something could be. Like the power in being that type of distraction, it, it added a whole new layer of gratitude to my work and why I love doing this type of work. To be able to create something that naturally comes from me, but that also has the quality of being able to uh, happily distract someone. It's a gift. I got a great gift to be able to do it. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, host of LPB's Art Rocks and friend and supporter of LPB. Art Rocks is LPB's weekly series that spotlights artists, performance, culture, literature, history and the impact of art in our world. It features Louisiana stories, as well as segments from PBS affiliates across the country. But tonight, the spotlight is all on Louisiana artists. We need to hear from all of you Art Rocks fans tonight so we can continue to air new seasons and meet more of the artists who use their vision and their talents to bring our communities and culture to life. Make your pledge online right now at lpb.org or call us or text GIVE to 888-769-5000. We have some special thank you gifts selected for your donation during this program, so let's take a look at some of those now. For a one-time donation of $360 or a sustaining monthly donation of $30, receive a Mimosa handcrafted river cuff bracelet, a set of four Mignon Fache stemless fleur-de-lis glasses, the LPB holiday candle and fireside scent, and your choice of a Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Fanway Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. For a one-time donation of $120 or a sustaining monthly donation of $10, receive a set of four Mignon Fage stemless fleur-de-lis glasses. For a one-time donation of $96 or a sustaining monthly donation of just $8, you will receive the LBB Holiday Candle and Fireside Scent with notes of cinnamon and evergreen infused with hints of smoke and citrus. And for a one-time donation of $72 or a sustaining monthly donation of $6, you will receive your choice of Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Van Wade Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. All items are by Louisiana artists and businesses, or you may choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donations support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today. Call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000 or pledge your support online at lpb.org. 
So now I'd like to introduce and welcome the CEO and President of the Baton Rouge Gallery right here in Baton Rouge, Jason Anderson. Jason, welcome to Art Rocks this evening. How are you? Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Great to see you here. What a great time to become a member, not only of LPB, but also a deeper patron of the arts by interacting and engaging with all the artists who are represented by Baton Rouge Gallery. Can you tell us a little bit, Jason, about some of the artists who have participated in that extraordinary piece that we just saw? Sure, there are uh, 65 different artists who are a part of the program. Uh, the masks have been a huge hit. They've gone all over the country, um, more than 30 states. They actually, some have gone to Norway and to Iceland. It's been an incredible program for us to be a part of, and the artists have been really excited about it. Uh, three in particular I wanted to highlight. Uh, Van Wade Day, I'll hold up some, some examples of their mask. This is a Van Wade Day mask featuring a work of hers. Um, who's been a long time part of the, the gallery. Her work has been seen all over the country from Nashville, Detroit, and obviously here in Baton Rouge where she calls home. Uh, April Hammock, uh, another Baton Rouge Gallery artist member. You can see these have a good bit of stretch to them. They're incredibly comfortable in your face. Uh, April uh, teaches at Baton Rouge Magnet High and has uh, also been a part of the gallery for uh, I believe over 20 years now. And then finally, Randall Henry, um, an incredible, incredible artist, been a part of Baton Rouge Gallery since 1985. His collage and painting work is incredible, obviously very colorful. Um, and uh, professor at Southern University, just an incredible artist, incredible part of Baton Rouge, uh, the, the larger arts community here in the city. You see, I mean, think about the, the contribution they've given, not only all the way through their careers, both as artists, as representatives and as reflective of our community, but also teachers and an inspiration to other creative souls. You know, to be able to support them and in turn the gallery with the purchase of one of these masks seems like a wonderful thing to do and a truly special time to do it. Now, so speaking of contribution, member support is really what enables LPB to continue to produce all of your favorite programs, not only Art Rocks, but really all of the programs that bring LPB to life as such a force in our community. And so that is something that requires all of us to do our part and contribute as well. So what we have tonight is some special credit card pledges for everybody who pledges during the show. I'd like to tell you a little about the first one. This is for a credit card pledge of $500. You receive a black and gold handmade apron, plus one set of four black and gold handmade table napkins artist we just saw, Mia Kaplan, plus all of the items from tonight's show. So Jason, as far as the gallery goes, LPB is 50 years, 45 years old celebrating this year, PBS is 50, but Baton Rouge Gallery is actually older and has been established for longer than either of those. Am I right in thinking that the gallery is celebrating 54 years as an institution in the community today? We are going into 2021, it'll be our 55th year. So it's been an incredible part of, of Baton Rouge's cultural landscape for more than half a century, which is kind of wild to think about. And the, the impact that the gallery and its artist members and its programming has had on this city for decades at this point, um, it's, it's been an honor for us to keep that tradition going here as we're into the 21st century and we're looking forward to growing it and expanding it even more. What an extraordinary thing to have brought to the community and what a way for it to be reflected, not only in this generation, but in the past and in the future. And really some of the most influential artists, teachers in the community have been members of the gallery as well, haven't they? They have. Uh, you think of uh, names like Ed Pramick, Paul A. Dufour, um, Frank Hayden, Caroline Durie. All these folks have shown at their work at the gallery, been members, uh, along with Jim Burke or James Burke, who is the only one of our founders back in the mid 60s, who is still an active current artist member and has exhibitions with us regularly. So it's it's really a slice of uh, Louisiana history and hopefully a good slice at, at the present and uh, what is to come. Yes, of course. And some of these artists have been featured on Art Rocks over the years as well. I haven't I mean I know we've done Jim Burke we've talked to Mikey Walsh we've certainly talked to Ed Collin these are some of the giants of our artistic community and they've been folks that we've had an opportunity to introduce to our audience 
uh, through the through the support of these of the members and the subscribers who become a part of LPB and give their part to keep the show going and to be able to share their stories. So that's fabulous. Thank you very much. Those of you who are part of tonight's show have we have a lot of thank you gifts that are going to be going out to those who choose to to become members during the show. Let's hear a little bit about those thank you gifts now. For a one-time donation of $360 or a sustaining monthly donation of $30, receive a Mimosa handcrafted river cuff bracelet, a set of four Mignon Fache stemless fleur-de-lis glasses, the LPB holiday candle and fireside scent, and your choice of a Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Fanway Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. For a one-time donation of $120 or a sustaining monthly donation of $10, receive a set of four Mignon Fage stemless fleur-de-lis glasses. For a one-time donation of $96 or a sustaining monthly donation of just $8, you will receive the LBB Holiday Candle and Fireside Scent with notes of cinnamon and evergreen infused with hints of smoke and citrus. And for a one-time donation of $72 or a sustaining monthly donation of $6, you will receive your choice of Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Fanway Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. All items are by Louisiana artists and businesses, or you may choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donations support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today. Call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000 or pledge your support online at lpb.org. Jason Andreessen, thank you for joining us direct from Baton Rouge Gallery. And now let's go back to the show where we're going to show you some of the other stories of artists from around the great state of Louisiana. If you have set foot in downtown Baton Rouge or explored the campus of Southern University, chances are you've laid eyes on the work of sculptor Frank Hayden. But these pieces only represent a fraction of Hayden's creative output. The Louisiana Art and Science Museum assembled the largest collection ever of Hayden's work. And with the help of artist Morris Taft Thomas and others, we've been able to bear witness to Hayden's life and work. Frank Hayden was one of the most significant Louisiana artists and sculptors of the 20th century. Artistic concerns have uh, always interested me, I guess, the uh, concern for aesthetics. When you look around this exhibition, it is very obvious that Frank Hayden favored wood as his preferred medium, Honduran mahogany especially, because it's got this beautiful, deep, rich, red-brown color and very natural variations in the grain that are just stunning when they are carved. He's got this beautiful way of working with wood. and. In some pieces, and earlier pieces, you see a slightly rougher finish, a slightly grittier finish. But when he went to Europe after his Fulbright Fellowship, I believe it was in 1968, he studied Scandinavian art and discovered the Scandinavian woodworking tradition and those sleek designs of their modern style. And especially in his later work, specifically 1986, those works are smooth and they are modern, sleek designs. He also worked in stone and in plaster and of course that bronze, that cast bronze. What's interesting is that he also worked in fiberglass. Fiberglass may seem like an odd choice, but you have to remember that it was a new material in the 70s. And so Frank Hayden was working with this new exciting material using these same techniques to make new sculptures. And it's not unusual for artists to work in many mediums and to dabble in something new or something interesting or to revisit a medium that they have in the past abandoned for whatever it suits their needs. If they want something large and powerful, maybe bronze, or perhaps that's cost prohibitive. And so wood is the great way to get the effect. 
I don't think necessarily every artist is that adept at being so skilled with every medium. Frank Hayden obviously was one of those rare talented individuals. And it takes time and dedication and practice and it's obvious that Frank Hayden was putting in those hours and developing those skills. Hayden considered himself a Catholic artist, was a devout practitioner for his entire life, spent many times at mass in the church and created many commissions for both the diocese as a whole and also individual churches. And he was a humanist, believed in the united struggles of men and often found stories from the Christian Bible to be the best way to express these issues. We see a lot of Christianity sprinkled into Frank Hayden's work, either touched on or as the primary subject. One beautiful piece that we have in this exhibition is called Pillar of Salt. And in it we have three women walking forward carved in wood and one woman turning back and she is cast in stone. And that is Lot's wife looking back, turning to the Pillar of Salt. Uh, we also have Joseph and his coat of many colors. What's especially wonderful about that piece is that it's carved in wood, so it's not colorful. But what Frank Hayden has done, in addition to making this biblical story, was to give us reference to African tribal textiles. These beautiful textile patterns are carved into the coat, and it relates two sides of him, this African-American man and this Catholic man, both coming together in one sculpture. Hayden was born in 1934, was a young man in the 1950s and the 1960s, in the Jim Crow era and in the South. These were issues that were part of his daily life, that he battled in every aspect. It of course came through in his art. What is so interesting is that we're revisiting these same issues. One of my favorite pieces is called 16 Men Make a Rod. And in that work, we see what appears to be a group of men standing in a line. But when you look closely, you'll notice that each man is an individual and they're casting ballots. Now, biblically, a rod is kind of like your lineage, your family line, or a tribe of individuals. And so you think, a family, they must all be voting together. But if you look in the hands of the men, each of them has an individual ballot, and there are yeses and nos scattered throughout. And I think it's a beautiful commentary on the power of your vote and your personal choice, despite what those around you might think, making your voice and your thoughts heard. One of the best places to see his work is in churches, both in this area, in the state of Louisiana, but also around the country, particularly where he went to school. So up around Chicago and in Tennessee as well. But in Louisiana, it's of course concentrated in Baton Rouge with a few public monuments in Shreveport and Ruston and New Orleans. But for Frank Hayden, he's in Baton Rouge and particularly he's on Southern's campus. Southern University has over a dozen works of him, either public monuments or smaller pieces that are kept in university buildings, the library or other buildings out there. The two works that Frank Hayden created for downtown Baton Rouge in relation to the 1976 bicentennial are the head of Oliver Pollock and the Marsh de Galvez Relief Fountain, both of which are located just off of the North Boulevard Town Square. On Southern University's campus, there are two more sculptures that commemorate the bicentennial, the Red Stick, and the other is Pelican, each of which are on the bluff at Southern University's campus. Frank Hayden was good friends with Adelaide Brent, the first director at LASM, which was then LASC, the Louisiana Art and Science Center. And Frank and Adelaide, in addition to being friends, were both Catholics, and that de devotion to their faith bound them 
in this additional way. Adelaide was able to promote Frank Hayden in Baton Rouge for these public commissions. Frank Hayden was, of course, more than capable, a very talented artist, but at the time, a person of color would have had more difficulty securing these commissions without assistance. So Adelaide deserves a lot of credit for Frank Hayden's work being scattered throughout Baton Rouge. One of the most striking things about Frank Hayden's work for me is his use of text, how he incorporated text into many of his works and in different styles. Sometimes it was very straightforward lettering, but often it was with a special, I'll call it a font that he created. And this font was blocky and had letters that nested into one another. An A could sit in the hump of an H or a B could sit on top of an N to make these puzzles which in addition to showing the artist's hand, and you can feel his words, the intentions he had, they also make you slow down and realize what he was saying. So many times with an artist, a work is unveiled or it's shown in a gallery, and there's an opening reception, and then it's forgotten. And if no one wrote about it, you don't know what the artist was saying. But with Frank Hayden, he took the time to say what he wanted to say on these sculptures. And I love that he's invited you to take time and to read and to pay attention to what he was trying to say. In an effort to show unity and to show the humanistic concerns that connect us all, you often see repetitions of families. You see repetitions of hands and faces. And this repetition and connectivity really speaks to Hayden's belief that mankind is one. Frank Hayden was born in Memphis, Tennessee and raised by his mother and lost his father when he was just five years old. She left his mother to raise him and his sister by herself. She was a school teacher and placed great importance on education and as a result really instilled those values in the children and enrolled them in Catholic school. They were a devout Roman Catholic family and it was the nuns who nurtured Frank Hayden's art production, noticed that talent when he was a young boy and helped him to fulfill his dream of studying art at university. They helped him apply and he got a scholarship to Xavier University thanks to the nuns. Xavier University, of course, is a Catholic university for people of color. He was able to be taken under the wing of Sister Mary Lorena Neely. I made a decision somewhere, I think, in sophomore year through the aid of a very good, uh, inspiring teacher. She was uh, a nun and an artist and every bit of both. And through her encouragement and advice, I decided to major in art. And I felt that and feel now that that was the uh, most vital decision because had I not done, done so, I would have been miserable. I would have been being an artist as an advocation rather than a vocation. So uh, making that decision uh, brought two things to bear. It, uh, it also was a commitment to art, but uh, it was a commitment to uh, the realization that uh, I'd never have a lot of money. And uh, I guess one has to uh, make that type of uh, commitment very early, whether he wants to chase the dollar or whether he wants to try to fulfill uh, his vocation. Sister Neely worked with her students to, with what she called the Guild. And the Guild provided students opportunities to work with public commissions for national and local regional art projects, giving them this experience. And thanks to Sister Neely, Hayden received his first public commission for a church in 1957 in Chicago before he graduated. After graduating from Xavier University, Frank Hayden had his choice of graduate schools. He had received scholarships to 10 universities, and he chose to attend Notre Dame University and study under Ivan Mestrovic who was an internationally renowned sculptor of religious and public art. Under Mestrovic, Hayden was able to learn how to work with wood, 
how to work in stone, and very importantly, how to work in cast bronze, which was an ancient technique that Mestrovic specialized in. On the Mestrovic, uh, I was able to see a man at work who uh, was uh, not only a leader of his country, but uh, uh, a man sensitive to uh, uh, art, to humanity, to uh, a commitment to, a uh, total commitment to um, creativity. And uh, I had never seen that uh, before in its purity. Uh, a man in his waning years, uh, in his uh, 70s, who could uh, outwork all of us put together, who could pick up a chisel or uh, take a pencil and record directly uh, and make significant statements with no struggle of, uh, with materials or techniques. So this was uh, extremely uh, vital to my growth. Uh, it, it developed in me uh, a reverence for all materials. Uh, it developed in me the discipline of work, to be able to uh, work uh, all day and half the night in search of some type of significant statement of material. Uh, it became second nature to me after a time and uh, it's, uh, it produces a type of delicious type of mental and physical fatigue which uh, I enjoy and perhaps that's part of my enjoyment in sculpture in that uh, not only is it uh, very mental in terms of searching out uh, one's content, trying to make a, an expression, but uh, the physical aspects of it is uh, it's rough, it's rigorous. You have to hit, you have to lift, you have to move, you have to cut, you have to carve. So um, I like the total involvement of self. With Mestrovic, Hayden found a mentor studied under him in the studio, worked with him on commissions. In fact, Mestrovic was working on the crucifix at St. Joseph's Cathedral, just downtown. And when Mestrovic passed in the middle of the commission, Hayden took over and completed that work for his mentor. After graduation, Frank Hayden took a brief job at Iowa University, which he only kept for about six months before he received a Fulbright scholarship. With the Fulbright Fellowship, Frank Hayden was able to study under Heinrich Kirchner at the Arts Academy in Munich. And there he found a fellow Catholic, a fellow passionate religious figure. And Kirchner worked in cast bronze as well, like Mestrovic had done. And it was a hard subject to study. It was a very complicated process, and not many people specialized in it. Under Kirchner, Hayden became professional at producing these lost wax sculptures, which involves making a plaster positive, making a mold of a negative, replacing it with wax, and finally replacing it with bronze, burning out the wax with molten bronze to get your final sculpture. The complicated process was not frequently used, but when you look around Baton Rouge, you see stunning works by Frank Hayden in this lost wax for all of his public monuments. Hayden worked at Southern University for 27 years and in that time worked with many, many art students and he was promoting young artists and supporting them to follow their dreams and to follow their chosen career path and teaching them how to get their art into the public, how to overcome the obstacles that they might have been facing and really just offering um, a nurturing environment. His environment, which we were part of, is really what made him produce those beautiful things. And uh, it's a simplistic thing that came out of his work, but yet we could feel, and uh, maybe that was something to remind us that we were all vulnerable in a way. And we are. And, and he saw that and was able to say that. But he got that from looking at our faces and watching fellow man struggle every day. And I think if there's one theme that he'd always try to remember, or remind us that remember, we are just people.
people, we're basic, and we need, let's not get carried away with the larger dreams. Remember that the kids must grow up, they must be cared for so that they can bloom. And that was this basic theme, I feel. Hello, welcome back. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, host of LPB's Art Rocks, and friend and supporter of LPB. This short intermission is our chance to tell you how much your membership support helps LPB all throughout the year and is your chance to be a champion for the quality programs you love, including Art Rocks. Call us or text GIVE to 888-769-5000. You can also pledge online at lpb.org. Now we have some special thank you gifts selected for your donation during this program, so let's hear about them right now. For a one-time donation of $360 or a sustaining monthly donation of $30, receive a Mimosa handcrafted river cuff bracelet, a set of four Mignon Fache stemless fleur-de-lis glasses, the LPB holiday candle and fireside scent, and your choice of a Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Fanway Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. For a one-time donation of $120 or a sustaining monthly donation of $10, receive a set of four Mignon Fage stemless fleur-de-lis glasses. For a one-time donation of $96 or a sustaining monthly donation of just $8, you will receive the LBB Holiday Candle and Fireside Scent with notes of cinnamon and evergreen infused with hints of smoke and citrus. And for a one-time donation of $72 or a sustaining monthly donation of $6, you will receive your choice of Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Van Way Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. All items are by Louisiana artists and businesses, or you may choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donations support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today. Call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000 or pledge your support online at lpb.org. Welcome back to the Art Rocks Winterfest uh, membership special. I'm here with Baton Rouge Gallery President and CEO Jason Andreessen and we are talking about the wonderful project you all have uh, embarked upon during the spring when COVID first uh, became part of our lives involving the creation of those incredible masks. Jason, tell us again about some of the artists whose work uh, you can, uh, that appears on some of these masks that you guys are making available during the course of the program. Yeah, it's been a, an incredible project for us. Uh, you know, a lot of what COVID has meant for our organization and for lots of arts organizations is all about adapting and, and pivoting and figuring out how to be of service. Uh, there are 65 different artists who are a part of the program, uh, and just to highlight a few of them, uh, this is one uh, from Van Way Day, an incredible uh, artist who's been a long time part of the gallery and part of Baton Rouge. Her work has been seen all over the country, from Nashville, Detroit, obviously here in Baton Rouge. Um, so this is her mask. Uh, it's You'll see it's made of, has an elastic band around it, very comfortable to wear. Um, another artist member, April Hammock, uh, her mask here, you can see kind of stretchy, but beautiful colors. Uh, she is a, an instructor at Baton Rouge Magnet High School. And then finally, Randell Henry uh, uses tons of color in his work, just incredible work. Uh, longtime artist member, he's been with the gallery now for over 35 years, uh, teaches at Southern University, uh, but a big, big part of the Baton Rouge arts community um, and even the Louisiana arts community as a whole. So we're thrilled to have them as uh, participants in this mask program that we've been on for for the last couple of months now. What I mean, and that's one of the great things about this is they come in different sh sizes as well, don't they? This is not something that it's not really a one size all situation. Just the way that art is not in its own right. Yes. Right. That's a good point. No, there's there's a, a large and an extra large mask. Um, again, they're they're made with elastic, so they're very form fitting. They'll kind of conform to your face. You can see they've got some stretch to them. Um, but no, there are two different sizes so that we can fit, hopefully, just about any face out there. 
That's fantastic. Really impressive. And of course, uh, you know, not everybody can uh, can make themselves available or an original of these one of these pieces, but this is a way you can not only take the work of one of your favorite art artists away with you, but also support both the gallery, the artist, and LPB all at the same time. So everybody wins in that scenario. I think it's just a wonderful example of creativity at work uh, all the way through the community. Thank you very much, Jason. That's really impressive. Let's Thank talk you. again a little bit about some of the um, offers available tonight for credit card pledges during the program. For a top credit card pledge of $1,500 or more, you will receive an original Eddie Mormon oil painting titled St. Louis Cathedral. And that's in the dimensions of 36 by 48. So we are talking about a true original Eddie Mormon piece. Many of you will have seen Eddie's uh, program segment on LPB, and it was a tremendous pleasure to introduce him there. Here is an opportunity to uh, own a piece of your own and also to support LPB one at the same time. So that's a really impressive offer for us here this evening. So I just want to take a quick moment here to thank two of the people without whom not a single episode of Art Rocks would ever see the light of day. Those being senior producer Dorothy Kendrick and also post-production supervisor Mr. Donald D. Ray Washington. Those folks have been with the program ever since its inception and they make every piece of it count and they take out all of the bloopers and the silly stuff. So without those folks, we couldn't make a single episode happen and we're tremendously grateful, both Jason and I, for making us not look bad. Donald and Dorothy, thank you so much for all you do. Now let's hear just one more time about some of the thank you gifts that are available to those who choose to uh, support LPB during this, during this program. For a one-time donation of $360 or a sustaining monthly donation of $30, receive a Mimosa handcrafted river cuff bracelet, a set of four Mignon Fache stemless fleur-de-lis glasses, the LPB holiday candle and fireside scent, and your choice of a Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Fanway Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. For a one-time donation of $120 or a sustaining monthly donation of $10, receive a set of four Mignon Fage stemless fleur-de-lis glasses. For a one-time donation of $96 or a sustaining monthly donation of just $8, you will receive the LBB Holiday Candle and Fireside Scent with notes of cinnamon and evergreen infused with hints of smoke and citrus. And for a one-time donation of $72 or a sustaining monthly donation of $6, you will receive your choice of Baton Rouge Gallery face mask. Choose your favorite mask by artist Van Wade Day, Randell Henry, or April Hammock. All items are by Louisiana artists and businesses, or you may choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donations support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today. Call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000 or pledge your support online at lpb.org. Well, Jason, I don't need to tell you this, but as you know, of course, we're here for the art, but for other viewers, LPB has something for every taste, every age, every area of interest, doesn't it? I mean, there's the nature programming, there's the science programming, education, whatever age you are. This is, there's really something for everybody. So whether you came to the program this evening because you have a love of the arts in Louisiana or whether there is another interest that you couldn't live without, these are all the reasons why you choose to support LPB and you, and you choose to support it now. Not just for Art Rocks, but for every program in the LPB schedule. And don't forget, everybody who subscribes receives a copy of Visions, a subscription to Visions, LPB's program guide, and also a, a subscription to the great Louisiana Life magazine, and access to LPB's passport program. That's the on-demand streaming service that is available 24-7 right from your computer connection. Jason? Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed talking with you, and thank you for all that LPB does. Thank you for all that Art Rocks does to keep us informed on everything going on around the state and, and even beyond the state when it comes to the arts. So thank you for all your efforts. Well, without you guys, we'd have nothing to write about, nothing to talk about. So uh, we really feel that this is a match made in heaven. We're thrilled to have you here this evening. That's uh, 
President and CEO of Baton Rouge Gallery, Jason Anderson, joining us from the gallery right here in Baton Rouge. And thank you for joining us for the Art Rocks Winterfest Christmas Special. Let's start in the studio of the Baton Rouge woman behind a thriving jewellery business. For Madeline Ellis, sales have gotten so good, her husband Dawson has come on board as partner too. Meet Madeline and Dawson Ellis, the owners of Mimosa, a jewellery making business in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Both of them got degrees at LSU in landscape architecture. While they pursued their careers in design, Madeline took up the hobby of creating her own jewellery. Many of her designs came from her work environment. To my core, I'm always very inspired by where I am culturally, physically, and I happen to be in Louisiana. I have the Monstera leaf. Here it's more of an interior plant. It can be outside in New Orleans, but it's part of the philodendron family, so I'm always very in inspired by plants. I have a river cuff. That's what I call the river cuff. Harold Fisk made these maps in the 1940s. The Mississippi River, uh, as it came down, all the different routes that it took and the different uh, sediments. They're beautiful maps and all, all the different routes are different colors, so I took and carved um, a piece that kind of represented that. The more jewelry Madeline created, the more she saw that people liked her work. So she completely gave up landscape architecture and devoted her time fully to jewelry. The artist soon discovered that her background in design was helpful in her new career. The way I uh, tack a new piece of jewelry is very similar to the way I would have attacked a master plan or any kind of design in landscape. Looking at all the different layers of it, so when I communicate on a custom piece with a customer, it's almost exactly, and it's kind of crazy, how I would do a, a consultation for a landscape design. I want to get to know your story. I want to know what is driving you to get me to design something for you. Same thing I would have done to create a space specifically for them. As the demand for her jewelry increased, Madeline had trouble keeping up. That's when her husband decided it was time to join her full time. Coming from her hobby maybe two years ago, which was a profitable hobby, um, to me selling my business last year to joining her about three quarters of a year, um, we've probably doubled sales since then. Now our goal is to just keep expanding and make it as big as we can. A quick survey of Mimosa's inventory reveals the Ellis's are now making bracelets, bangles, necklaces, earrings, cufflinks, and more. Just what goes into making a piece of jewelry? Madeline describes the process of coming up with this Be Happy pendant. There's quite a bit of drawing and quite a few renditions before I finally hone in on the, the, the final piece that I'm going to be carving. Madeline then chisels her design into wax. It's a really plastic kind of wax, so you have to carve it with like a Dremel tool type thing or X-Acto knife. There are different tools to use for it, but it's very hard. It's Dawson's job to convert the wax carving into metal. We will make a silicone mold of it. So uh, making a mold to where you feed uh, metal like veins, they call them sprues. That's what feeds the molten metal into the cuff. So to set that up into a mold uh, would be the next uh, process. And then once we do that, then we can recreate as many as we want. Even after the metal jewels are cast, there is still more work. The polishing and the grinding and cutting the sprues loose and uh, the finished product is uh, probably, I'd say, in each one's an hour, I guess, once you start to finish, but you're also doing hundreds of them at, at the same time. Madeline and Dawson work with a variety of metals, giving customers options on just how much they want to spend on any specific piece. It's like a little BB, uh, the silver and bronze and gold. So we, we've worked in all three metals so far. And it just comes in a little Ziploc bag and you measure it out to where the metal, the, the specific gravity of the wax and the metal equal each other. With Dawson taking over production, it gives Madeline more time to focus on designs. And I love highlighting things that people don't necessarily see as unique to Louisiana. I work with Cane River Pecan Company. The owner sifted through thousands of pecans to find the perfect pecan for me to take a mold of. We took an actual mold of that pecan and created some jewelry from that. I like to create pieces that help people kind of tighten their relationships around it. One of my most popular pieces is the You Are My Sunshine. I, like It never ever gets old to hear somebody come in and say, oh my grandmother sang that to me or my mom sang that to me. Um, and then, oh my mom did too. 
While the Ellis's sell much of their work online, they also set up booths during major activities. Madeline says she loves the opportunities to interact with her customers. I'm hearing the whispers of like, oh, this piece is kind of off, or I'm hearing, oh my God, I love this so much. So I take it all in. I like to sit down and digest it and then put it out into like, I need to do better at this. I need to hone in on this over here. Um, so it's really great for feedback. Yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, it's uh, kind of a dream. We wake up and say, I can't believe this is our jobs. Now here's an interesting project that brought the City of Monroe's arts and businesses community together in a big way. The Heron Project has filled the Washita Parish seat with six foot tall sculptures decorated in every style imaginable, and Monrovians are going gaga on a heron hunt to track them all down. Brooke Foy has the story. Herons on the Bayou is a public art project. We had quite a few projects that we were working on for the city, trying to get our environment a little bit more engaged. We really have been lacking in our public spaces, art where people can see it, not just in a gallery or a museum. And I got the beautiful opportunity to work with a partner of mine, Emery Thibodeau, and we started doing murals and public art projects and really getting out there and showing people how beautiful art is and how much it can do for your community. And the next project that really sort of felt right was the Herons on the Bayou project, which is projects that you see in lots of different communities where they'll paint tigers or pigs and all these fun characters that really mean a lot to your community. And we started thinking about what would be an icon that would represent our community and let's just try it. We went through the black bear, we went through the catfish, lots of things that mean a lot to our state. But we kept thinking about we're a Bayou community. have a lot of water and what is an animal that we see that maybe we're just forgetting about and we love the idea of doing a bird it just sort of resonated with us because you wouldn't normally see a bird done and they got these really spindly legs so it makes it kind of difficult and we just blew it out of the water our community has just really supported the project and just really loved it we have been blown away by the amount of design options for the herons we had over 250 designs submitted for 51 herons. Because we were able to go past 20, we have 51 of them. You do just happen to glance around and there's one there. If you're driving around town, our community is so small that as you're driving around, within a couple minutes of your drive, you're going to find one if you're on the main drags, if you're on some of our main streets, some of our main community areas, they are everywhere. You kind of have to be not paying attention to not see them, which is really wonderful. When we think about our artists that actually got to paint them, it brought the kid out in them as well. They got to just think of something fun that they could do on a bird, which was kind of something that they hadn't ever done before. Most They're painting on canvases, they're painting on wood, they're doing commissions and things like that. This gave them an opportunity, so once they painted them, then our community has just jumped on and just felt like this is a fun game. This is, let's see how many we can find, and we're doing a wayfinding element so people can go online and they can go like have a scavenger hunt and find them. They're really finding them really fun and exciting. <laughs> 